Mm-hmm. I'm fine with occasionally having someone else no. start the podcast nope. if you want. No. Nope. <laughs> you start the podcast? Welcome to Noclip. I'm Chad Rowan. I'm JJR Timez. And I'm Andy Kennedy. And today we're going to be talking about The Cat Lady. Uh, the Cat Lady was a game that was released in 2012. It was developed by Harvester Games and uh, is like an adventure, like a horror adventure, graphic adventure game. <laughs> adventure, adventure. adventure. Kind of like a point and click, but you don't point and click. Yeah. Right. You move in up. Yeah, arrow keys. <laughs> An arrow key adventure game. Which, if you have like a controller to play this game with, it actually makes it super convenient because you just sort of lazily kind of grasp it in one hand. <laughs> As you, like, move left and right and up and down with the analog stick, it's, like, the only thing you have to do. Oh, yeah, this would be a perfect game for controlling with exactly one, like, Nintendo Switch dongle thing. Oh, like, yeah. Oh, it's the Switch version. Oh, this is perfect. <laughs> it's perfect for the Switch. Uh, before we get into it, I think, I, I feel like this is a game that we actually should put this in where we are the game itself and us discussing the game uh is going to include discussion of like depression and suicide and if that's not gonna float your boat uh you probably bail now but yeah uh this game opens uh with your (laughs) with the lead character killing herself immediately and it sets the tone for this game like right out of the gate as your character, Susan Ashworth, is not somebody who's, like, crying for help. They are, like, committed, and, like, if somebody came in and told them that it was a bad idea, it's not going to convince them one way or the other. And, uh, so this game is bleak as hell, especially right at the beginning. Should we also throw up a spoiler warning, since we did that? With Life is Strange, because it's like an entirely narrative-focused game. That's true. I think at this point, Life is Strange was 47 episodes ago. (laughs) True. I think we've established ourselves as a spoilerific podcast. Yeah, I mean, just for good measure. Alright, don't don't listen to this episode if you haven't played the game and want to. (laughs) Spoiler alert done. (laughs) Skip to right now in the podcast for spoilers. (laughs) No, they don't. The spoiler warnings are not like (laughs) skip to this to hear every spoiler. Here's the time code to skip the spoilers. Here's the time code to get all (laughs) All the spoilers. spoilers. Skip to episode 55 on Animal Crossing if you'd like to avoid spoilers on this game. But anyway. Yeah. And it with the bleak atmosphere, <laughs> no jokes, jokes over. Only, not, <laughs> this is not going to work. Oh, mm-hmm. God, no. we didn't even consider this. But, uh, yeah, this is, this is a game where you play a character who isn't, like, a, a manic suicidal. She is, like a, like, a, like, a committed, pseudo-rational suicidal person. This is... This is something that's been that's been building in her in her life for a long time, uh, and it's a, a nice, bleak, somewhat terrifying to me anyway. Way to kind of open all of this tone wise. Uh, why? Not why. How? Uh, <laughs> Did you hear about this game, and why did you recommend it for the podcast? Because I just trust you implicitly as a human being. That's good. And played this game start to finish with no information or knowledge at all about what it was or why you cared about it. Uh, Okay, so the way that we found this game is a little bit up in the air, but I believe uh, was part of a chain reaction after Andy and I had played the adventure game Harvester. Um, which amused us a lot. Like it is a ga- like the game. That game is extremely tongue in cheek and sort of uh, the, its whole purpose for being was to be like video games don't make violent people. So we made a violent video game about video games making a violent person. It, it's like weird, and they try and go for like a meta sort of thing, and it ends up being like. Twin Peaks without any subtlety. Yeah. And mm. it's also, like, 
from the early 90s and has like fmv and it's just like it's a total weird like hidden gem Mm -hmm. you should play it if you can yeah but if the if the subject matter of the cat lady (laughs) didn't bother you (laughs) then you're probably cool to play harvester and the developer of this game being harvester games i think somehow when trying to find out anything we could about the development of harvester we ended up uh, looking at this game, and I've had it for years, honestly. Um, and uh, Andy and I, as well as uh, longtime podcast fans, will recognize Dan and Janelle uh, played it over a weekend. Uh, I want to say like a year and a half, two years ago, oh. something like that. And uh, I generally enjoyed it, so we brought it up for the podcast. Yeah, I remember we brought it up pretty early, and it just took us a while to get around to it. Yeah, it's such a unique game. Mm-hmm. I, at least in my opinion. There are yeah. a lot of elements of this game that I think are super, like, that set it apart from other things, and that's what I find really interesting about it. I would agree. Mm-hmm. Does it have anything to do with uh, the constant dissonance, I feel, when people talk about the genre of adventure games and how much this game is in no way an adventure? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if any okay, if uh, uh, Guybrush Threepwood <laughs> walking around on an island for like a week mm-hmm. constitutes an adventure, I think that somebody dying, going to the afterlife, <laughs> and then returning to the world of the living to start a blog counts as an adventure as well. <laughs> Sorry, that was just a like a kidney punch to genre conventions that I wanted to throw in there. That's fair. Uh, yeah. It is not a criticism of the people we do doing creative things in their subject matter. <laughs> uh, and God, this definitely qualifies as creative, even if it's creative in a sense that can make you physically uncomfortable if you're not prepared for what you're about to find out. Great. So the follow-up, of course, to you asking me how I found this and why I recommended it, uh, and more humorously to me, the fact that you trust me implicitly <laughs> and just played this game with no forewarning, uh, how did that go? Because I think... It doesn't take a long time for this game to go from, like, z- like I don't know, zero to 60 in terms of, like, the crazy shit on screen. Yeah. It went from uh, Nior to, like, Dark Tragedy to, like, Cthulhu Madness Zone <laughs> in, like, in, like, two minutes flat. So I assumed uh, that it was... The Cthulhu Madness Zone that was initially going to be like I like I calibrated my expectations to Cthulhu Madness and just thought that like that's all I was going to experience and I was like oh that's that's why we're playing this oh god what's gonna happen to me uh, so I was really surprised when the game and happy for to, for reference when the game came like crashing back down to earth again when you literally and figuratively yeah when you return <laughs> to the earth. Uh, but yeah, playing through this, I was it was I liked that, that you put a, a psychological horror game on on the docket. Uh, I like the way that it presented itself most of the time. Mm-hmm. Some caveats, but God, this thing is weird. That, like <laughs> especially the later episodes when they kept shifting the tone and seemed to have gone a little bit off of initial message. Uh, but. I do, uh, especially the early episodes, the hospital especially. Mm -hmm. Hospital's my favorite sequence in all of it. I did really enjoy my time with this game. And I would never have played it if you would not have just been like, play it, do it, and then (laughs) don't ask any any questions. So, Like in any other context, I probably would have looked at the Steam profile of this game and been like, eh. So good job of making me like suck down my peas and expand my horizons. Suck that, like, vegetable peas? Yeah, yeah. Is that where, okay, all right. Yeah. I wasn't sure exactly where that metaphor was headed. Uh, <laughs> Let's just move past. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, yeah, okay. So, uh, then that that kind of mirrors, I think, our curve when we originally played this game, where we weren't positive what it was that we were exactly getting ourselves into. I have... Uh, I have a lot of sort of feelings on this, and I agree that there are times when the tone gets a little bit, like, wacky and, yeah. like, spins out of control a little bit. But overall, like, the the creativity in this game and, like, just how, like, they, there wasn't concern in this game for convention. Not at all. They were just, like... 
let's just roll with this. And I, when I say they, in reality, this game was made by uh, not that many people, and principally, uh, and I'm going to fuck up his name uh, because it is difficult to pronounce, um, but he goes by R. Mikowski because his first name is Remigwiz. <laughs> it, like, ends with an S-Z. It seems like a strange combination of, like, a Latino name and a Polish name, and I don't, I don't know how to approach it. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> as it seems to be, like, the general consensus online is difficult to pronounce game design. <laughs> uh, and I, I think this was, like, this is really one of those, like, auteur efforts. Where yeah. somebody sat down and went, like, I want to make this game with these themes and this visual style. And just was, like, did it. Someone was literally just, like, I want to make an adventure game that locks your resolution to 800 by 600 in 2012. <laughs> well, I believe... This game was made with Adventure Game Studio, and I'm sure that there's some limitations on the, like, all of that. Like, every technical aspect is probably limited because that software is 15 years old. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this game has a lot of the inconsistencies and, like, polish that you would expect from, like, a, an indie game, like, a, with that small of a team. But I think what sets this game apart is that it's smart. It's really well written, and it's like it's does not feel like an amateur effort. Like these themes and kind of visuals, I think could be be handled very poorly by a small team. Like you know, there's not a lot of immaturity or anything like that comes through, and how you might expect this game to be if you just looked at pictures of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I think you're completely right on that. I think that this kind of uh, the like one man ideas guy uh, type of work is the on- is one of the only ways to actually achieve the goals that this game was going for. As we saw, it stumbles sometimes, but handling this as part of a big team would be the worst thing imaginable because you're getting input from a million people on a very personal story. And even, like, a small team can have some sort of... There would be some conflict about how people wanted to see the thing go. So the way that this game was made as as sort of an incredibly small team effort uh, really, I think, is is the way that this game achieves its goals. So having completed all seven chapters of this, I... When I first started this, I th- I was, like, crystal clear on what I felt like the message and themes and tones were going to be. I thought it was just going to be a game where I was going to start walking through and go through these, like, crazy metaphorical experiences about suicide and the world degrading around me and lots of horrible things specifically about, like communities and uh like institutions this game is really skeptical of like basic institutions like uh like the fire department the police police. mental health agencies not a lot of love for it hospitals pest control yeah community this game has it out for community support internet (laughs) yeah 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 Yeah. uh and i thought that that was going to like just be like the, the the beeline through it. But now that I've actually beaten the game and taken the time to look up a couple of the different routes and ways that this can end, I don't think I know the thesis. I don't think I know what coming out the other side of this game they wanted me to think or know or learn, if anything. Uh, and it's mostly because I... I think it's mostly because of a lot of the weirdness going on in chapter six and seven tonally. It seems like... They started this trying to be, like, a crazy metaphorical madness game, and they kept that going strong up and down a couple of points, and then they pushed back on it hard toward right. the end. And I'm curious why they did that, or if that's supposed to, like, recontextualize what we think about the other madness stuff before that. So I think... Uh... So chapter six is a little bit of an anomaly because that's where your principal like pu- puzzle solving sort of stuff that is in most adventure games sort of comes into play. Um, that being the section where you're walking around in the apartment complex and sort of like getting into everybody's shit 
And I, I feel like there's kind of a weird tonal thing when you run into uh, what JJ will be learning at this oh, moment. Yeah. Uh, was his name someone Davis? Joe Davis. Yeah, uh, that's the one. Who's the lead character from this developer's previous game, Downfall? Oh, and his whole story doesn't fit in the game at all. And they even do it as almost like a like a, a this game's version of a dream sequence, I guess, where after you finish the puzzle of getting a book and counting hands on the wall, you just sort of, like, wake back up in the apartment complex. And I like, I feel like that, while was a cool individual scene, wasn't really appropriate for this game. No, it, it feels like a shoehorned way to reference his previous game. Right. It did include one of my favorite individual scenes of the game, uh, even though it definitely... It, it tied in only in only in its horror, not in anything else of any deeper meaning. Right. Uh, that scene being uh, the the chairwoman scream. That was a solid scream. That was... Yeah. <laughs> That's something I wanted to get into a little bit, um, which uh, we'll just footnote here for now, but, like, you can kind of tell that because of the how this game was made and how like, presumably very low budget it was, mm -hmm. that everyone who did voice work did not, like, they didn't fly out, come into a studio and record their lines. Like, one of the principal characters, Mitzi, sounds like she's being recorded over, like, a Skype call. Yeah. And probably was. Yeah. And I think it's fine, like, in the long run. Like, the fact that this game has voice acting at all is kind of miraculous. Uh, but, yeah, when suddenly... Someone shrieks at you, like, through, like, the fucking speakers are bottoming out while it's happening. Yeah, it was a memorable moment. Misery. Yeah, it does that. I can't remember if that particular, like, kind of puzzle was in Downfall, like, the part with the mirrors, because I was thinking it was, but I don't remember. <laughs> I feel like it was we've also as well. Played it. Yeah, we've seen. played Downfall, so... Uh, I'm not 100%, but I believe it actually was. That voice, by the way, was the game's uh, developer. Mm. So does that, uh, does playing that game also explain the like end of chapter stinger where he's like in a, built a wall uh, like in the basement mm -hmm. and he's locked away with an obese woman that he's maybe torturing? I don't know. Uh, that is like... Uh... Well, I don't. I actually kind of don't want to spoil Downfall. Oh yeah, by but all it, means it, don't. it is actually it's like related to that game. Okay. Yeah, because it, it makes it. It, it make, I think that Stinger is there to make it clear that Cat Lady takes place like contemporaneously with Downfall. Uh, okay. Yeah. Because I, because to someone ignorant of that, I thought that like the entirety of Chapter Six then was going to be this setup. For, for like the, it seemed like they were undercutting this Joe guy being the villain, mm -hmm. and then the stinger exists to be like, oh no, he's definitely actually the villain. Right. And then they just, just never brought up again. No. Uh, well, the game hurries itself to the end after at that point. Like it, it's just like let's get, let's move on, let's get to the credits. Yeah. God, how did this even happen? This discussion that we were having. <laughs> I don't know. I think it was. We were talking about how the tone of this game mm. uh, has some diversions near the end uh, that may or may not have worked for it. It took a long time to get through the like puzzle meat of Chapter 6, where you're just kind of, honestly, tonally sort of goofing around mm -hmm. all of those apartments. It felt too lighthearted for this. I, I, I thought that they were setting up like a potential more terrible horribleness that were going to happen between you and your best bud. Right. Uh, but that also generally didn't happen. I've cross-checking against other references, uh, other endings that you can have in the game. So there's, she never really betrays you or is like another sacred parasite or something. Right. Like is, she can die, but not in a way that really like makes her character bad or makes the circumstance tragic. It's always like a heroic sacrifice or like a greedy little thing 
it, uh, <laughs> sorry, don't do that. Uh, what, what I mean, what I mean is that it seemed like they were setting up a circumstance where they were trying to make you happy. Uh, like, like, like these two are best buds and they're solving c- crime together or right. whatever. And then, then that was going to be undercut hard in chapter seven. But she's still just kind of always your friend. And if you do somewhat reasonable things, by the end she will remain your friend. And you'll have, like, best buds forever time. Right, until she dies. Well, she doesn't have to die. Well, she dies. Yes, she, she does. She, she, she has, has cancer. cancer. Uh, oh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> She dies after the credits. Right? Yeah. Wait, wait. There's, there's an epilogue at the end where she's like, I'm writing this blog because something, something, but Mitzi died. Yeah, it's like a year yeah. since Mitzi died or whatever. Right. So, yeah, she does have to die, but she doesn't have to die in a horrible way, which is what happens in one variation on the on this game. I do know, uh, which I, of course, did not get because I made one decision, which I do think is reasonable, that I think the game punishes weirdly by not making the ending available. Right. She doesn't die in the, uh, what's apparently referred to as the golden ending. Uh, and there's a, there's a golden oh, ending. The gold. There's uh, gold in them there, endings. Where uh, you stay... <laughs> <laughs> where you stay true to your promise to never kill anyone, she just miraculously gets better and is fine. Oh, interesting. Yeah. She's just, she's like, no matter what happens and everything worked out. But that, that's weird for only one reason. Uh, not because, you know, oh, she miraculously cured and beat her cancer. It's a thing that happens in the real world. Right. And this game is lots of uh, things less believable than things that happen in the real world. Yeah. Uh, but uh, what I sort of took issue with with that link is the light, and frankly, the light that it, uh, that it put into the scene afterwards as well. Uh, the whole way that they present the ending of chapter three, I think it was. We're, we're gonna, not going to be able to like past six and seven. I don't think we're going to be able to know what happens in a chapter by number. Oh, okay. So feel free to give like a brief summary of the chapter if you want to. Uh, uh, pretty simple. Uh, the art murderer. The horrifying, uh. yeah. Uh, I had apparently, uh, without knowing it, set up a circumstance where y- you get the option to just leave if you want, and you uh. have to like work hard and like answer all these questions apparently to get the option to just leave. And I did that at first because I thought it was like that was in line with the wishes of your friend woman who died who might not have existed. Right. It, it, standard stuff for mm-hmm. this video game. Uh, but the game seems to really... It made that choice feel not appealing to me, not just at the time, but afterwards, so much so that I actually like stopped and went back to another save and then went back and killed the guy and kept playing. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the opposite of when you played Undertale. Exactly. You like went back and were like, nope, genocide ending. <laughs> That's what I'm doing. It was... You don't call the police. Like, it's so weird. I thought they were setting up a circumstance for, like, because after you get the key, there's just a key that's miraculously there that you can use to unlock and leave and walk into the hospital and not even, like, address right. the crazy murderer. Uh, but what you do, if you do that, is you just, like, put it behind you. You don't even call the cops. They're, you're just like, they won't believe me. They think right. I'm crazy. Continuing to, like, the weird <laughs> skepticism of community institutions that pervades the game. Uh, you just don't do anything about the circumstance. You just, like, leave her to die and don't and leave the murderer to be a murderer. And I hated that so much that I went back and killed the guy, and apparently this <laughs> denied me the best ending. The golden ending. Where your friend lives forever. Right. And is beautiful. Well, yeah, and they set up all of the the villains, the, your, the parasites, as they are in the game, as being, like, unredeemable sort of like monsters Mm -hmm. but i think this plays into because all of this has been relevant to the initial question that you asked oh so long ago at this point which is you aren't sure if this game has necessarily a message or like something that it's trying to convey yeah i think that it does i think what the game is about though is not making some sort of cogent point about like society like i think that that cynicism is all supposed to be interior to susan yeah and I think that the game itself is just about the uh, the process and like very like ranging from heavy handed to like so subtle that you're not sure it's even a metaphor, <laughs> like this metaphorical journey of getting over 
depression or like living with it as opposed to just killing yourself. The game does not have a positive outlook. No. Like for sure. Like you don't go you don't leave the cat lady going like, I think life is gonna be cool all the time. But it's supposed to be like a little bit hopeful. Like it's supposed to be like you can totally get over that and it showed what she needed was like a support structure. Yeah. Like yeah. people to be around. Like, yeah. I think, so, I think the internal. Ver- yeah. The yeah. very simple message is what they're going yeah. for. I think yeah, what it seems like is that the game is going to have like a much more like metaphorical or complex or like weird or right. something you wouldn't expect for its message. And it ends up just having this very simple, almost kind of corny one <laughs> of you can get over your depression if you make a good friend. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was I was just very confused going through it, especially when they started taking the steps back from the crazy cosmic power stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, because when they stopped addressing it at the end, like... Like, here's an example of some of the questions that I was asking myself as, like, credits starting to roll. Like, so does she actually still have the power to come back from the dead? Because that's not... Like, that's... The first death... Well, not first. The stabbed to death, repeatedly death? Yeah. That that was actually her, like, unquestionably coming back from the dead. Right. There is... She had no injuries. She was just, like, walking around fine. She, like, went home and took a shower. Yeah. The second time that she dies, she has bleach poured in her eyes and then shoots herself in the head. So, like, the returning from the dead is, like, a complete rebirth in the, like, in cat lady physics. Yes. Or however you want to call it. Yeah. You're totally restored at the, like, physical location your other body was. You're just fine. Right. Uh... So then, in what ways is her depression... Like, is the lady that gives her that power a metaphor for her depression? <laughs> like, how how does... Because when it was a crazy the Cthulhu-esque madness game, yeah. you're just like, oh, this is death incarnate. It is giving me the power to revive from death to do some unknown horrible thing in the world. Sure. Uh, which is the reason that why I initially started playing, that I was very distrustful of this entity. Uh, but by the end of the game, they're trying, they like, they take a couple steps back and they're like, no, this is all like crazy psychological stuff. Like, they make it more believable as you play the game more that it's just her having these crazy hallucinations. Sure. When it's like demonstrably impossible that a lot of them are just straight hallucinations. Yeah. The, this is the reason that I tried to at least, like, in the moment, take everything the game presented at face value. Like, whenever Mm -hmm. possible, like, this crazy thing's happening, okay, this crazy thing is just happening. The, like, their key points, like, the things that happen when you are dead are obviously, like, even further removed from reality. Yeah. And therefore, like, more difficult to, like, you can accept that. You can continue suspending disbelief as long as you are dead. Yeah. But... That's why I dislike the sequence with Joe Davis so much because it it doesn't make sense because she's still just standing in that room the whole time. Yeah. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Like it's <laughs> like it, it wants to do that classic like blurring of the line and leave you feeling like what was real and what wasn't. <laughs> right. You know, but, have its cake and eat it too. But most things do that in terms of like world design, and that's very familiar. What the unfamiliar thing that this game does is that it does it thematically. Like I don't know. At some point, the game's message switched from this like tale of cosmic significance and like personal change and madness and instead into this like more narrower story about this character overcoming her depression and those both cannot coexist at the same time because her depression did not give her superpowers so right. there's just this weird like <laughs> what was how like like normally when people say like it was just was it just a metaphor as if like maybe it was a metaphor and you're questioning that mm-hmm. in this game the question is Maybe it wasn't a metaphor. <laughs> maybe <laughs> and don't. Maybe you're actually there. Were there was actually a weird demon lady. Uh, yeah. It kind of. I feel like I made this uh, comparison with Life is Strange. Mm-hmm. Um, or I made this point with Life is Strange. I want to make the comparison between the two games. But uh, it it feels like it has this setup with all of these like fantastical elements, and then it kind of like when it gets closer towards the end, it kind of, like, switches it around, and it's like, oh, 
the reality of the situation that they stumbled upon is now like upon them right. and now it just focuses in on that mm-hmm. and all the fantastical elements go away right yeah no you're you're that is correct because it you can tell like basically after the i guess what would be depending on your choices the next to last time that you come back to life uh is sort of like the point where it just stops like you do the little puzzle where you're at the dock and you get on the weird elevator uh, oh my god, that I love that. That was a really great... That, that whole sequence was amazing. It was we'll, great. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about... I feel like that's actually a good way to, st- to structure our sort of mechanical discussion is to just go sort of beat by beat. Sure. Um, but when you come back that time, uh, it, it, it makes the switch where it's like the stuff that was the driving point behind this game at the beginning to get you to sort of start doing things... It does make that switch, like you said, but from this overarching narrative about, like, life and death to a really personal narrative, also about life and death, but different <laughs> people's lives and deaths. <laughs> about uh, life and death as, like, a like a description of the world, not as a noun. Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so suddenly, like, you kind of get super specific with Mitzi's story and with uh, the the eye of Adam and yep. all that yeah. as you sort of just sort of go through it and uh, I think they overstepped their boundaries a little bit during that last chapter but other than that I thought it was fine I think that actually was executed pretty well because if they kept going with it and the eye of Adam was just like the last parasite and then you get another like cutscene at the end that's like good work <laughs> Like that would be super jarring and weird. Well, yeah. that would if 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 they just said like mission accomplished. <laughs> sure, but in yeah. most video games that would be flipped. In most games, that you would have confronted your death metaphor after yep. completing. That's what I was just gonna say. Was it feels like they got rushed for time and they had to like wrap it up. Like it feels like there's a chapter missing at the end. Yeah, mm. it, like you never go back and visit death. Well, I think because the way to go back is to die. Uh, you're you're m- going to do some hand-wavy bullshit. With this <laughs> I don't about. think that you can do it. She literally shows up as a shadow behind one character to just to be menacing. She you could have just have, been in her apartment. Yeah, I, I guess that's she true. She could just visit her. But, I, okay. Even, <laughs> even so, given unlimited development time and resource here, I don't necessarily know that I would have wanted Death to be the final boss. Like, that's, no, that's a not weird... what I'm saying. Yeah, this game doesn't even... This game doesn't have bosses. I'm not even saying, right, like, yeah. you have to go and, like kill her or somehow like just like you this is go, a scene yeah you go and you talk to her again and something's revealed to you yeah right. it's the like everything comes home hero's journey arc that's the expected like last segment where mm-hmm. you you get back from doing all of your parasite murdering jobs and then you address the overarching story uh, the I have superpowers and death has wanted me to murder these people story right. but instead of doing that it just flips it and you go to death before you even address the final sequence with the final parasite. Right. But I think... Okay. I'm going to... Like, I don't know if this is necessarily devil's advocate. If it was, it would be hysterically appropriate. But uh, I want to make the argument that that is actually a good decision because, like, if they had... If you had finished... If you, like, went in and, like, Mitzi pulled the gun and you're like, whoa, 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 and walked up and just, like, snapped the dude's neck... (laughs) <laughs> and then walked out, and then, like, were warped back into hell or whatever. Mm-hmm. Suddenly, the story... <laughs> I, I feel like the the result of a story that is about this character overcoming depression through friendship, as corny as that sounds, is far more powerful than the story about how they chose to bring someone back to life, which is something that clearly doesn't happen... <laughs> Presumably ever, at least not very often, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because there were, like, five dicks in London. <laughs> like... <laughs> but that's how the story starts, right? It's, it's how it starts. It's how it's presented. And I think you're supposed to, by the end of it, go, well, this is kind of bullshit. Because that makes no sense. The world's problems are obviously larger than five assholes in London. The... The, it shows, like, a weird level of short-sightedness on the part of, like, what is supposed to be sort of the, the deity character. 
<laughs> and it also gives like kind of a weird tidy wrap up to what is not supposed to be a tidy wrap up a bowl problem. <laughs> like this is agreed. It is not tidy and their reversal at the end kept it from being tidy. But in that case, I would have preferred at the start for there to at least have been some like better tonal comparisons between what you were doing with like a contrast to having a friend. Like if, if they did something that made it feel less horror, spooky, crazy Cthulhu-y right. and more I am totally alone, that I, I feel like it would have fit better because you would have had that transition between the Cthulhu madness is what it's like <laughs> to be alone and in depression and you're fine when you're with a friend. There's a little bit of that even in the, even in the endings. I, I, I took note of this because... In, when you start going through the bad endings, which is when you let Mitzi die, she, she, she dies to the gas, and you put the gas mask on yourself for no clear reason. Uh, <laughs> that, was, that seemed like the most non-choice. Yeah, yeah, right? You're immortal. You're actually immortal. Uh, so you put the gas mask on yourself for no reason. Uh, and then I, when you leave, when you walk out the door... There's Cthulhu mad and shit everywhere for a few seconds, and then you get back to death. Right. Uh, it, it's... Uh, and it even more so than when you actually die in that scene making the opposite choice. There's the, the eyeball shit, the deer. My favorite of all weird comparisons and metaphors this game throws at you is the deer that is very rare and that just bounds off in weird circumstances. I like deer. Oh, right, because at the... Okay, I remember this now. I was like, the deer? Yeah. Or, yeah, because at the very beginning you follow the deer. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. I got you. Yeah. I've... So there is this vague link at the end between Cthulhu madness and being alone, but I wish at the start they would have made it clearer that, like, you are experiencing Cthulhu madness because you are alone. Uh, so that it could have made a nicer loop with the friendship angle. Right. I, I think that the, the that sort of, like, being alone is shitty. Uh, well, being alone with depression specifically is shitty, is the... The sequence that I think we at least agree is, like, one of the least engaging sequences in the whole thing where you just make coffee and go smoke on the porch because there isn't anything, like, outlandish happening in that scene. This is, like, right after you get back from the hospital. Yeah. And the enemy in that is the then-never-used-again red and blue bar system. Uh, well, that's because that was a joke. I, I feel like it might have been... Okay, you make debates about that. I think they intentionally, almost too heavy-handedly, were trying to make a joke about the systems not mattering with the red and blue bar thing. Right, like a sanity system or something. Things that games like to shoehorn in just to like yeah. give you some semblance of uh, agency when you don't yeah. actually have it. I think it was poor execution, though. I yeah. agree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just annoying. Yeah, and you know, like the second those bars come up in this in the type of game that this is. Like, I just knew, like, there's nothing that I can ever do. Yeah, and it, it punishes you for playing the game like it's an adventure game. Like, <laughs> most things that you'll look at will, like, piss her off and, like, right. make the meter go up. And for things that, like, you have literally no... <laughs> like, foresight. Yeah, like, yeah. you're not going to be like, I probably shouldn't look at the mail. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> I guess? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that sequence was... Like, the whole purpose of the sequence is supposed to be like, oh, it's predetermined, no matter what you do, you're just gonna always going to have another freakout because that's what it's like to have depression. But putting up literal meters right. on the screen... Well, I don't know if it's necessarily... I don't think that that was the message that they were going for necessarily, but they were trying to show sort of how difficult life for her can be given, like, her outlook. And, of course, it results in, like, a dude showing up and screaming at you, yeah. which if you're a cool guy, like Andy and I, you'll just make fun of him the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, which is pretty great. And then uh, the se the sequence mercifully ends at that point. Yeah. You don't need the meter for that, though. Mm -hmm. Like You can just experience her life, and you can subconsciously think, like, oh, there's a lot more shit than happy stuff going on right now, and you understand that. Like, it would be like... If in some kind of drama story, they just implemented, like, 
a happiness or sadness ticker to like the top that was like a tracker that went up and down really, for like each a character. stock ticker be like, like now you know exactly how happy and sad all these characters are at all times it's it was just really forceful yeah i think we all agree the meters were stupid yeah, yeah. there's a and there's better ways like i'm not trying to shit on people trying to like mechanically represent depression in a way that's not just straight narrative exposition that's right. fine uh, like, I think, like, the game Depression Quest actually has a really funny kind of good way to do that. that I funny, like. maybe? I, I don't think. Not not at the time. I mean, funny, like, thinking of... It, 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 it's clever. It's a clever right. use the, of that The trick. way that, the, that, the, that that game works, if I'm correct, I've, which it's been a long-ass time. Yeah, it's been a long time. Since 2011 or something when that came out. Yeah. But you... As you, like, depending on the choices you make, they just gray out good options, showing you sort of, like, going deeper and deeper, right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It's like a text adventure thing. I forget the, like, a twine game. It's yeah. just like a twine game, but the more, your penalty for making decisions that make you more depressed and accruing a higher, uh, like, level of depression is literally graying out options on, like, a multiple choice for the things that you can do. So you right. can see stuff like... Like, go take a walk and the, go with your dog, and it's just, like, grayed out with a line through it. And it's just, right. like, not an option. Yeah. Sit at home, eat pizza. Yeah. It becomes, like, your only choice. Yeah, I like that as a representation for it. So there's ways you can do, like, clunky mechanical representations of depression well. It doesn't just have to be narrative, but narrative is definitely better uh, than non-interactive bars. Yeah. That, that is definitely true. The bars are a little dumb. Um <laughs> I do, like, cause, b- because, like, d- depression and suicide have become more, like, in the forefront of people's minds nowadays, sort of uh, more <laughs> legitimized, I guess, is what I want to go with. So it's, it's a d- depressing thought, but, you know, this is this is. podcast, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's this game. And that's just a fact. Like, I mean, people are more aware of the issue, like, mental health as, like, a concept. Yeah. So I appreciate it, because as much as people... Either praised or started a riot and a movement to destroy creativity uh, uh, over Depression Quest when it came out. This game, I appreciate the fact that they made an effort to bring the subject into like something that, at the very least, more people could engage with. Yeah. Because like, I know tons of people... Re- realistically, myself included, who look at a game that's entirely text-based and go like... Uh, maybe someday, <laughs> but like, <laughs> I don't really want to do that. Yeah. Whereas this game has this has a visual style and like actual sort of more traditional game mechanics yeah. to make it like accessible to more people. So I don't know. Neat choice of visual style, which I think we should talk about after the break. <laughs> <laughs> But you needed to join and we need to do like a full like which we should talk about after, after the, the break. break. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back from the break. Uh, one of the things that we discussed, like, at the very beginning of the podcast was this, like, idea that this game doesn't really care about convention uh, in its design. And one of the major things, probably one of the things that has, like, the, the sharpest edge when it comes to whether or not this game is going to either work for people or even, like, be purchased by a lot of people is the art style and the fact that it is so not typical yeah like doing black and white with some color is not the most unique thing in the world like that's obviously happened in tons of media prior to this but it's also the like just like really uncomfortable semi-realistic almost hand-drawn style like where everything looks like it's a drawing on paper and then just like cut out and Made to like bounce up and down to yeah, simulate walking. It's got kind of a collage look to it, where like I think some of the art assets in here are taken from real pictures mm-hmm. and then just like thrown in there. The trees, I think, were yeah, in the first like, sequence are a good example. It's got that uh, 
we had to cut out whatever we could to use for this kind of a look to it. And it really works in most places. There are some spots that are weird, mm-hmm. uh, like with everything else in this game. It's like a little <laughs> bit. There's some inconsistencies, but for overall, it works really well. My favorite use of the style uh, was during the uh, painting murderer scene when you actually confront the murderer, and like the way that they chose to animate him was in ways that like almost weren't physically possible for a human he was his arms were like bending up and down doing strange marionette things that didn't make sense yeah. when they normally keep things like roughly in line with what people do and can do when they try and animate these just like essential stick like cutouts with just like basic joints when they're moving to the other scenes right uh, but it, it it made him seem a lot creepier and a lot more like a, a, a crazy puppet person, which clearly fit and perfectly with the tone that they'd set up before then. Yeah. It, it's, it's obvious to say that like the art and animation sort of go hand in hand to establish the visual style of a game. But because this game's the style that this game is going for is something that is like off-putting and uh, oftentimes like disgusting or just disturbing in some way they really made the the, they really made the most of meshing this partially realistic art style with this wholly unbelievable animation style where everything's very simplistic and very jerky and sort of you know it which could be a limitation it could just be like the engine just didn't support finer animation Mm -hmm. but because of that it made this weird clashing of 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 reality and unreality that I think ended up just being way more effective than having it done yeah. in a different way. It feels like they leaned into the limitation. Whether or not it was the engine or they just didn't have any actual animators on staff or right. whatever it was. But yeah, it they turned it into a strength because it it does add to the uncanny feeling of the game. And you can tell that they did have the room to lean into it less because during the hospital sequences where you're on medi- like or medications, right. your animation becomes smoother and more, not human-like because you're on medication, but like you sort of walk and move smoothly. Your joints aren't nearly as jerky as they are at any other point. There's less immediate stop and start. Right. Uh, so... Clearly, they had some room to be more gradual and human-like if they wanted to, and they intentionally chose to make you weird and jerky all the time instead. Mm-hmm. And also, like, I, I really like the way that they uh, used color in this game because while the like lighting as a concept is something that is sort of difficult to replicate using. Uh, the tools that they had available to them, they used color in that same way, where as you would move from place to place, things would become like more blue or more orange. And uh, so they had the like the stark colors where it would be a fully black and white image that had like a splash of red on it. Uh, but then they also had these more subtle changes where everything is still monochrome, but tinted a different color uh, to give the impression that the scene was trying to create. Uh, notably, like, when you're outside and, like, you walk into the sunlight and everything becomes just a little bit yellow. Terrible note on that. Uh, when I first started this game, uh, I use uh, constantly to try and keep screens from destroying my sleep schedule, uh, like, the Flux program, which is this thing that lets you change the dimness of your screen. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you can manually turn it off and everything. And normally I, I remember to before games start... But most of the time with most games, uh, it, it has this like built-in functionality so that it, it's less noticeable when you're playing other video games, in my experience anyway. But uh, this game, because it's an old game made with an old engine, apparently didn't have any of that like accountability. My, my <laughs> computer did lots of things when I tried to run this game. Uh, but uh, it, it didn't account for that at all. So I thought, like a dumb person when I'm playing this game, like, oh... Everything is orange. I wonder why. 
<laughs> they made the choice to make everything orange. Uh, it's because it was on, like, warm colors mode. Oh, yeah, because it was, like, 1 a.m. Because, you know, it's spooky games. So you right, play yeah, at you 1 a.m. Yeah. Uh, so I just restarted the game uh, after I realized that I had gone through, like, the crazy, beautiful color scapes when everything was just orange. So I wanted to see it, <laughs> and it was nice and worth it. So I think the other half of this game's aesthetic is probably in the fact that there was a lot of sort of original music that was created for it. Really? Uh, and the... Well, I mean, they, they used... I'm not sure if all of it was uh, directly created for the game or if there was some licensing that was going on, but, uh, like, the music credits uh, credit, I believe, uh, the developer's brother, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, and I think that it... It is his band that did the music for this. And this aesthetic, both with the the way that they utilize color and visuals, animation, and the music, has this, like, I don't want to say cringy. <laughs> Uh-oh. But, like, it goes pretty extreme at times. It's tonal whiplash to the... To a, to a pretty ludicrous extent sometimes with the music. Yeah, and uh, it's, part of me loves it, too. Like, some of this, I think, is really good and, like, functions exactly as it was intended to, but there's certain elements of the game that I think may the dial may have been turned up a little bit too high. Opening credits? Opening credits? I don't know. It set the tone so well that I have to give it a pass. Uh, not not opening sequence. The opening sequence at the time. I perfectly. actually really love the opening credits. Oh, with the like the metal riff while your arms cut off and you're running around I, I, bleeding I like, out. I love the the stylistic choice of having it like stop for a second while the credits pop up. Okay, fair. Mm-hmm. Like I, I I think the like, whole package I think comes together in a way that makes it work. Hmm. It seemed like uh, I interpreted that sequence specifically anyway as the music trying to turn what was mostly a psychological horror experience into more a, a more of a conventional horror experience where like you know heart is pounding you're running away from a monster you're going right. to die sort of that sort of thing uh, and for a bunch of reasons including the animation style uh, it it seemed like like it's really hard to try and make a game that just like straight up boo scares you considering the fidelity level that this game was working at. Yeah. And that's what I thought that they were trying to do with the like metal core opening credit sequence. <laughs> but that was my honestly my only complaint with the music in the whole game. It, it was pretty stereotypical. I assume like you were saying cuz they were trying to lean into a lot of the tropes, yeah. a lot of dung pianos. Yeah, the the dung pianos, which is not a small <laughs> piano that you play with your dick, uh, is uh, are kind of prevalent throughout. Like to uh, uh, emphasize a like just sort of an unexpected moment. Mm-hmm. Um, but and there's there's a lot of ambient music that I think works really well. Um, and it, it's just like occasionally they'll put in these uh, these other songs, and while I do kind of like the opening sequence as well, I feel like there's two. I think there are two other instances. One of which is in the end credits, which I think is obviously fine because you can do whatever you want over end credits for the most part. Uh, I don't think I've ever played a game and then gotten to the end credits and went like, "I just ruined the whole experience for me." <laughs> Uh, but there's there's definitely a part in the middle where they use it, and I'm like, mm, I don't know about this one. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm not going to uh, dock it for that. I thought overall the music was really good. There's They use metal a second time that I forgot about for a second, which is uh, the other huge, jarring, tonal swift... Or, the, ta- swift. the Taylor, Taylor Swift. Swift sister. <laughs> yeah, tonal, tonal Swift. swift. <laughs> <laughs> they use the metal a second time uh, in, a, in a way that's also super jarring that I didn't expect, uh, which is right after uh, the piano sequence with with the meters that we complained about in the yeah. first half. Mm. Uh, there's like this like pretty piano soundtrack, uh, and then you've got like metal core over her breakdown, which is very mild breakdown, a lot milder than I expected. <laughs> I'm just amused at the the use of both the phrase metalcore and breakdown and not referring to <laughs> like a breakdown in a metalcore song. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like I 
I expected, you know, cosmic terror shit when she has a breakdown and she just, like, smashed a mirror and, like, went into your room. Yeah. Yeah. Which I thought was good. Like, I thought that that sequence worked well and then the, the metal music made it, like, that's the total break that you're talking about. That is, yeah. yeah. For the reference, by the way, metalcore as a genre is not really what's being, like, displayed here. Mm-hmm. It's more just standard metal, whereas metalcore is more, like, is it's metal and hardcore, so... I didn't know... <laughs> That's the dumbest description of a thing I've ever heard in my life. Uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> it's metal and hardcore? Hardcore yeah. is a genre. Hardcore is a genre. And so now he's like... not just calling it hardcore. Yeah. <laughs> and I knew he didn't. I just assumed other people did in the past. But so so metalcore is also a genre? Yeah, metalcore, metalcore is like what Mark uh, likes to listen to. Oh. So like uh, Attila is a metalcore band. I do. That's the only one that I can think of. What were the that. odds that you could reference any band uh, from a genre I don't know about and I would know them? <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. Maybe the Devil Wears Prada, but they're not. They're more like a post-hardcore band. A good pick, because it's actually a name I've heard before. That's well, it's a probably movie. movie. Yeah. <laughs> oh. The movie about the band where Meryl Streep... Uh, I think it was also... Wasn't it a novel first? Probably. Anyway... Example of the tone in this game actually working really well. Uh, music, art style, everything in combination... Uh, my one of my favorite scenes, and I have many favorite scenes of this game because this is a generally good game, uh, is the sequence in which it's you finally it, when there's like the, the time distortion when you're you're being kidnapped by the cannibals, and but it's flashing back in time to when you're not kidnapped by cannibals, right? Uh, and you're having pleasant conversation with your friend. Pleasant. Uh, well, yeah. Well, this game standards. Oh, <laughs> yeah. This is probably the happiest moment <laughs> of the game. Uh, and she's di- and in the happiest moment of the game, uh, when she's discussing with you uh, how to create like a suicide potion in your own home, um, I oh my god that I love the music uh, and like the sound design in the sequence where you get up after killing yourself mm-hmm. and it starts like going through like and this is how you make the bleach thing because you're like oh shit she's coming back in town yeah yeah <laughs> i love that, that chapter as a whole um did a really good job of sort of setting up it contains like one of the higher and lower points in like the the arc of ashworth uh where you end up with the scene where you're having this like very long conversation with Mitzi, and they do, they do a smart move by interspersing parts of the level into it so that you don't, or you're not sitting there for like a million years, but you're sitting there for like five hundred thousand years <laughs> while uh, the initial part of the conversation takes place, and it's a necessary exposition dump, but it does feel like it goes on. F- forever Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but that chapter is also great because it's like the one scene where you feel like your character is entirely in control yes and i feel like that is the like the second act the rising action of the story about depression is where you gain control of yourself to the point where you are now like you are in a dominant position over those who would seek to harm you. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, a, it's very weird. Like, it's not a thing that you would normally uh, see, one, in a horror game, two, in a game about, or any media about depression. Like, and it has this, like, iconic ending sequence where you, like, walk into the distance with a shotgun and a gas mask. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's a very, like, explicit about it. Right. That was the other reason why I found that the prior sequence uh, with the crazy art guy where it seems like the game is trying to incentivize the secret cool thing to do to be to just leave, Mm -hmm. weird and out of tone with that. Yeah. Yeah. I I wanted to continue the upward climb of you getting power over yourself in horrible, violent ways because this is a horror horror game, but uh, still continuing the climb of controlling over your life and your depression. Uh... Well, it's to the point where, because like in, in most horror games, you play as the victim of violence, and yes. in well, in some in some instances, I guess I should say, mainstream horror games, you perpetrate far more violence than most of the things <laughs> that you're set up against. But uh, in ones that actually strike a uh, a, a traditional horror tone, uh, typically you are 
well underhanded. Uh, and so it's it's strange to see your character that one be immortal, so it takes away any like concern of actual death, and to re- realistically go on like a straight rampage, like a middle aged London woman, just like fucking dead rising two duct t- duct tapes together a doll's head in a a uh, fucking buzzsaw and like chops a dude in half with it and then just goes on with their life. Oh. And it's still as effective as a horror game for the most part. Mm-hmm. I'm sad that you, uh, in that sequence, by the way, that you no- don't use both weapons if you assembled them because I was trying to be like weirdly tactical about it. Mm-hmm. And I, well, I was excited about the baby doll head saw blade mace. Right. Uh, but I never got to use it because I was like, oh, clearly you've got to use like the long, the reach weapon first with the spear and like, you keep your distance. Right. So it's, that... yeah, it just becomes Dark Souls. <laughs> yeah. Keep that shield up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You keep, you, 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 so you can't like, you know, bring to bear his weight upon you. Like the, uh, like a, a lion tamer with like the chair. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And then I thought I was going to, I was going to come in after that with the mace, but no, he was a fool and was just impaled through he the neck. He blindfolded himself. There was zero percent <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. Oh, it was a blindfold? I thought it was a spooky mask. Oh, yeah. Well, it, same. He still, like, he blinded himself by putting something over his eyes. Yeah. But, yeah, because that's what we we decided uh, that it would be in our best interest to use the spear this time. Because the cause spear is actually difficult to assemble. Dif- you have more, to, it's, it's more difficult. There's more assemble. stuff that you have to find and you actually have to solve a puzzle where you lather up some stuff. <laughs> that was, by the way, it's a very weird. It's weird. Yeah. It was a weird moment there. Well, that's, that's like adventure game shit uh, and like bleeding in a little bit because like no rational human person would go like, oh, I can't use the soap. It's not wet yet. I'm going to go, I'm going to take it back into the thing, lather it, then put it in my pocket <laughs> because it surely it'll be fine for use l- went later whenever I find the thing to use this on. Mm-hmm. Um, the other instance that I was really upset with being the fact because they spell it out on screen, the tin of paint. There's oh, like a thing yeah. of red paint and they're like, oh, I can't carry this with me because it still has a lid on it. I was like, you're right. You really want to have like the paint spilling everywhere <laughs> when you're carrying it with you. It's yeah. unreasonable to assume that you'd be... Because you can combine things in your inventory yeah. in the game. Right. So, yeah. There's no reason you couldn't just take it with you. Exactly. <laughs> it's really strange. Very strange. But yeah. So we, we definitely... Our first playthrough, we made the mace and killed him with the mace. And then the mace shows back up during the doc sequence uh for use as a lever Mm -hmm. uh but the spear is it's functionally the same thing yeah and the spear doesn't show up later if you use it instead so i don't know what it's because the spear is not visually cool that's true it's just a it's a long pipe yeah i don't even really know why the spear exists yeah it, it has no point to being there well it's got one point Ha ha zing. <laughs> that was really good, actually. <laughs> Thank you. One hundred percent best joke on the mm-hmm. podcast. <laughs> can we zoom in for a minute on the wharf? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I I want to kind of go more. into sort of the more mechanical as far as adventure games go <laughs> side of things. <laughs> uh, so yeah, let's 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 look at the wharf because it's. Probably one of the more interesting sequences in the game. I think Wharf was my overall high point, and I, I think I liked the Wharf more than anything else that I ever liked. We're gonna rewind the podcast here because I think you said that already about the hospital. Oh, you didn't but, say the hospital is your favorite, <laughs> but it's fine. I have. Oh my god, I'm gonna be the worst old man. Mm. <laughs> I'm, I like the idea. That, like, you're just like, I just love everything about this game. Like, <laughs> you go get, like, a the Cat Lady t shirt. Dude, I don't <laughs> it wear It seems so unexpected for you to have liked this game as much, I think. I don't want to wear depressing t shirts mm. first. I want to get that out of the way. Don't get me depressing t shirts. What about a t shirt that has the scene with her with the gas mask and the shotgun on it? That's it's, not depressing. That's empowering. So, yeah, yeah. By, all, by all means, if you're going to get that. I'm not saying every scene in the Cat Lady is depressing, just 95% of the scenes. <laughs> <laughs> but 
Uh, but uh, despite whatever I happen to believe about how much I like the different scenes in this game, I don't know whether I like Spider Heart more. I think I like Wharf more than Spider Heart. But uh, in 20 minutes, I might change my mind, apparently. Uh, but uh, on Wharf, I thought it did the best job of bleeding in and it making it actually ambiguous whether you are in a horrible dream sequence or not until close to the end. Yeah. Yep. I mean, obviously, because the things that they give you in the Worf sequence, because obviously you start questioning things after you go back into the room to your left and realize that you're still just in your living room. Mm-hmm is the first break, and then, like, the walls close in, but they're, like, catacombs, fucking walls full of skeletons. Um, And I don't know, horror movies have taught me that the catacombs under Paris have, like, skeletons just glued onto the walls. I don't know if that's accurate or not. I don't think it is. I think it's it's mostly stone, (laughs) probably. (laughs) But uh, either way, it has, like, skulls and shit on the walls, and you have to break through it with the mace. Uh... And then you leave, and it's sort of, like, still a normal area. Yeah. And it's probably the second most, like, adventure game puzzly thing. Mm-hmm. But you never really get confirmation that you're just dead as hell until the very end when the elevator crushes you. Right. And that I went through the specific rooms in the wharf in a different sequence that made it less ambiguous. Because mm-hmm. the first thing that I saw in the whole sequence was I walked out, uh, it, like, outside, and I was like, oh, shit. Someone's kidnapped me and taken me to a crazy wharf. And then I keep walking, and then the background elements start forming numbers. Right. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, hmm. <laughs> in, a, in a way, like, maybe this is a lot of the strange ambiguity stuff, like what happened in the hospital with Sheila and all that. Right. Uh, I thought this might have been like, oh, maybe this is bridging the gap between, like, her weird psychic powers and reality. Uh, and then there's, like, a crazy spider knitter. You have to stab in the face with your shadow knife. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That was really good. Uh, Also, this is the only, I think, environment in the game that's fully colored, which makes it stand out. It does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's getting... Well, I think the, the, like, afterlife areas typically are. Yeah. But this one is, like, 100... Like, I don't think there's a single area that's completely black and white. Right, unless when when you go back into the apartment. Right. It is, but... um, gonna say something else yeah. well I, I wanted to go into because uh i I've, i'm curious as to what jj thinks about this because he is the least familiarity among us with adventure games generally mm-hmm. um the numbers in the background how did that like strike you immediately i, I it struck me as another piece of the weird uh between reality and a dream mixings that were going on. I took note of the numbers because obviously I'm playing a game and like in and out of character. That's like this is like a weird important omen that's being brought to me. Right. But no, I loved the numbers as a sequence, and I loved that I experienced the wharf in the in like a scaling order of madness that made it more pleasing for me. But right. Do you seem to have like a problem with these numbers? It, not so, like that to me is a really positive reading on it, and I think ideally that is I think what the game wants you to to come away with the problem is that this kind of a thing happens in adventure games a lot where it'll just be like some shit on the ground and you'll be like oh it spells out this when you do a thing like one of the earliest adventure games uh potentially ever but definitely one of the earliest that i've played the seventh guest is like there's a whole sequence where you just have to like alter your perspective on like a little puzzle to get the combination to something. I think it was in the seventh cast. I might have been wrong about that, but you know what I'm saying. I do. Like, this kind of puzzle exists, and to me, it feels weird and out of place in The Cat Lady because of the way that this game sort of functions. If you can't guess the name Sheila before you get the full thing from being on drugs... uh, then I don't think you should be <laughs> that that Susan should know that the numbers are there because from her perspective she wouldn't be able to see him. Yeah, and that to me comes off as a little bit inconsistent. It does kind of break its own logic a bit. I didn't care that much, right, obviously, right. but like that's one of those things that I'm like, I feel like there could have been a better way to do this. Yeah, I also think uh, in its specific implementation, it's just way too obvious. Yeah, personally, I. If it was a little bit harder to notice, I think that would have been better. 
This is not going to be my hill to die on. Uh, oh, no, I, I don't imagine. And I, I appreciate your reading of it and think that it's a great thing that it ended up working for you. Yeah. It's just because you aren't jaded. <laughs> <laughs> True. And I did not have played a lot of these adventure games. The only single moment in this game that I felt like I was being cheated by adventure game puzzle things uh, was actually the previously referenced Sheila puzzle. Relatively early in the game, too, which made me kind of worried as I was starting to push into it. Right. Uh, I The fact that you had to sit there and turn on the faucet and wait for it to steam up to reveal that, right. I felt like not only... like it, it broke logical sense in a setting where, up to that point... There hadn't been any reason for you to assume strange illogical things were happening. Like it's not like in the wharf sequence where you realize very quickly that you're in some kind of like crazy horror dream and lots of other cra- stuff is happening around you. Like in order to access the horror dream of the hospital, you have to go through. Well, well I guess wait, not necessarily. I'm just thinking of it from my perspective. I gotta, I gotta correct this because I went through <laughs> it in that order. I, I didn't find the crazy horror dream until I've wandered around for six million years and then figured out that if the top water gets left on forever it'll just appear in the background right because i was just goofing off and just turning on all the taps because i went like what if they run out of water (laughs) (laughs) i'll have to bring in a water fixer to bring water uh so i I was i got pretty deep trying to figure out the name of the woman uh and it was kind of mad but it was just like this random thing i never found clues for yeah the I don't know. I, like I, to break down the Sheila puzzle, uh, to totally go against what we said we were going to do, which is talk about the wharf part. I feel like it's important talking about the design to break down. I think this specific puzzle is sort of like uh, an example. The this game doesn't use traditional adventure game puzzles as much. It still is a lot of inventory stuff, but it tends to just be sort of speed bumps on your way through the narrative kind of things. The Sheila puzzle is an example of something that is specifically an adventure game thing. You have to manipulate something in an environment, put together a couple of clues, and then use a few inventory items in order to resolve an issue. And the way that they do it, I think, is kind of admirable because it is probably the most complicated puzzle in the game, and they put it right on Front Street. Uh, but in order to do it, they had to introduce this thing with the the bathroom steaming up. And they go to the lengths of making all faucets in the whole game interactable, <laughs> which is good because it's not like an immediate signpost, like, hey, turn the faucet on, because you can't do it anywhere else. True. Um, but I think they push it a little bit far, uh, because they put, like, a thing on the wall that says, stop writing messages on the mirror, <laughs> which is a little bit, like, heavy-handed. Um, but then additionally, when you turn on the water, what it reveals is the word lie, which is way more... Like, because it's an actual word, it acts as a red herring, which I think increases the sort of, like, mystery on it. I, I really liked this puzzle, but I felt like there were... It has its ups and downs even in this just, like, one area. Yeah. I never got the lie thing, the, the fact that it's, like, backwards like that. Mm-hmm. That's a cool reading on it that I think would have made me enjoy it more because it would have felt like its own interesting piece of what's going on in that setting and not just, like, a half-completed bit of a puzzle that I need to solve. Right. So I'm really glad to think about it from that way. It increases the level of paranoia that you should feel when you're in mm-hmm. the hospital. Right, right. Uh, to give it like a, a contrast for the kind of adventure gamey puzzles that I really liked, I loved the puzzle where you have to get your shadow into the buzz saw. Yeah, I think that the whole the whole wharf section is the best puzzle design in the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the whole like getting the two levers and sandwiching her your shadow till she gets to the end is definitely. Cool. cool. <laughs> Definitely the best piece of uh, puzzle design in the game, for sure. Yeah, it, it's... it's the Taken as a whole, the wharf section works. I like that puzzle because of the uh, sort of atmosphere. Because putting yourself through the grinder is like, one, a callback to something thematically at the beginning of the game. And just, like, visually interesting. The only issue I take with it is probably a very me sort of complaint is just the fact that the time between when you figure out how to solve the puzzle and the amount of time that it takes to execute on it is like 
really long and involves a lot of like toggling in the menu and isn't really engaging. True. But it is. I feel like there was probably a more elegant solution to it that could have kept the tension of having to watch you slowly advance one at a time, but also made it less tedious. True. Because you don't want to be like, ah, finally, I ground myself into soup. You want to be like, oh my god, like, this horrible scene. Right. Mm Mm-hmm. And I did have, I I did get hit with that feeling when I walked out of the horrible spider knitter room with another person with me. (laughs) That was a pretty, like, It hits that sweet spot of, like, taking just long enough for you to realize what you have to do. And, like, it has that epiphany moment where you're like, oh, yes. (laughs) Figured it out. Yeah. It's one of those things where adventure game fans uh, tend to, like, or claim to like puzzles that are like so obtuse and difficult to solve, but that really hinders the narrative experience of a game. And because this game is so just intent on delivering its narrative, the styles of puzzles that they chose were really good, I think. Yep. So to move beyond the wharf. Uh, which I think is actually going back in time as far as the game is concerned. Uh, There was one other thing, and this is sort of both a puzzle note and an aesthetic note, and I just kind of wanted to get your take on it, uh, because I already know Andy's take on it. Well, you could elaborate. All right. But there's that... You love to talk, Andy. (laughs) Jesus. Uh, There's a sequence uh, after you die where you're you're told, like, one of these doors is the way back and the other one contains a reward. Mm Mm-hmm. And the whole setup for that, I thought, was so clean and good with the reveal of, like, the big eyeball, like, the raven, and uh, the two... Now, obviously, it's just asking, like, what is now a sort of rote and traditional logic puzzle, (laughs) but the visuals really kind of come together to give you this nightmarish hellscape set in a theater of all things and it's uh, like it comes up to me that comes off as one of the more standout moments in the whole game uh and the part where the visual style can get real weird and i really enjoy it when it does yeah it, i feel like it it puts that pressure on you like it's like you really don't want to mess that question up because right. like those like striking horror visuals make you think that like something just totally terrible will happen if you make the wrong <laughs> decision. Yeah, with the the giant dolls with a head the yeah, size the, of your the, body. The bloody kind of porcelain <laughs> faces or whatever. Yeah. This is I also like the, the story sequence. of a girl. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know the rest of the line so I can't continue. But this is an example of a kind of weird forgiveness that I've always had in my life for rote no- like logic puzzles. Right, yeah. Uh, and I want to get I want to get both you guys' take on this. Uh, what do you feel is the half life of like important logic puzzles like this in media? And uh, half life might be wrong. What I mean is there is a certain point. Like everyone hears that puzzle for the first time, mm-hmm. and the first time you hear it. Super good, interesting puzzle. Yeah, right. It's like it's like one of the. It's like the reason it gets reused so much. It's like one of the best logic puzzles. It's it's like hard while still being easy and approachable enough that anyone can really do it if they put their mind to it. Uh, but uh, you know, the fifth time you go through that puzzle, <laughs> not the best. What do you think is like the necessary cultural spacing between the use of that puzzle? Because I don't want to throw it in the trash. It's a great puzzle. Like yeah, it. definitely a solid puzzle, one of those classics. I feel like as long as there are people who haven't encountered it, you're fine. Because someone, like someone in your demographic could reasonably approach it and go, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Then I think you're okay to use it. But you don't want it, like, if you played a game a week ago that used the puzzle, don't be like, I'm using that in mine. I feel like it has to feel appropriate. Right. I feel like it did here because it the, because it set up a thing of uh, like an abstract scenario. Yeah, I think that pretty much hitting the nail on the head. Like, does it feel appropriate? Does yeah. it make sense in this situation? 
in the because I remember the first time that I heard the riddle was in uh, in in Doom Patrol. I don't know if you've gotten to there. I got to, I got to that point. Yeah, yeah, because the way that they they get rid of the of Orquith, the Bone City or whatever, <laughs> is by asking uh, like, why is there something instead of nothing? And I always like. If that has done a really good job of making that puzzle feel relevant to me, because that's the version that I remember, but it isn't the pure version of the puzzle. Right. So every time that I encounter it, I try to apply the same logic and come up a little bit short. So I have to like make a slight adjustment in my memory every time, and uh, it made it more interesting that way. I see. Yeah, I just I didn't want the children to be denied their cool logic puzzles. <laughs> yes, yeah. and. Also, like, we might just have a friend group who would, like, disproportionate amount to, like, normal people. Like, I'm sure all of our friends have heard this puzzle before. Yeah. But, like, that might not be true of, like, another group of people. They may have, none of them have ever heard it. Crazy if I'm wrong, but you put it in a D&D campaign once, didn't you? Me? Yeah. Uh, I'm not Dan Harmon. Who, who or Dan Harmon's DM did that? Did I do that to you guys? I actually forget. I I've, don't think so. Mm, we'll discuss because this later. He would have known that Dan would just know the answer. True, yeah. But unless it was put in, put him, put him I on don't, the spot. I don't think that we put it in ours when we did our joint. House Either of way, riddles. you 100 percent did not. I no, remember every okay. scene in your House of Riddles. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's the vanguard of the House of Riddles. He's going to make sure J- nobody gets lost in there again. J- JJ's been working on the novelization of our D&D campaign. Uh, to move the conversation from D&D back to the game at hand, uh, do we have final thoughts? Uh, the core question you have to approach with this game is are you like mentally and emotionally not just prepared but willing to go through uh like a psychologically deteriorating experience uh if you are and you feel like you would enjoy that go for it Uh, but that's a niche audience thing like not even in a horror sense of do you want to be scared because this game doesn't scare you very much it just freaks you out a lot makes you feel uncomfortable uh, and if you're up for that, go for this weird thing. Uh, it, I really enjoyed it, even though I don't generally enjoy things of this tone. Uh, and it's short, and I don't know how much it costs. This can't cost much. Oh, no, not at all. I, I think it was like 10 bucks yeah, or something? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Absolutely go for it. I, I don't like horror stuff. I love this because I like psychological stuff. Uh, I love this game. Uh. I think as I get older and the more games I've played and, like, the more we do this podcast, the more and more I appreciate, like, a genuinely unique game. Mm-hmm. And this is a genuinely unique game. It doesn't... There's nothing else looks like this. It's unique among adventure games. It's a good story. Uh, it, it handles these themes in a way that I haven't seen done in other, in other media it's it's a it's a definitely a hidden gem if if you think you can handle the uh, kind of material it deals with then absolutely play it yeah it, it isn't a, it's definitely a unique game and I think it's something we tried to stress at the beginning the only thing that really comes close to it is its predecessor downfall uh, which by all means you could also play that we might cover it some year on like Halloween or some shit but uh, very similar even a lot of the same voice cast uh, between the two and it uh, kind of strikes I just think the reason that because we've played both of these games the reason that the cat lady is the one that comes up uh, for us to discuss is because it's t- like the way that it, it meshes its narrative and tone uh, in order to create sort of a cohesive package is just so strong um, that I feel like this game really speaks to what the adventure game genre started out trying to do. It has its interaction and, you know, inventory puzzles, but at the heart of it, it's trying to get across this this tale, this, this story about, in this case, the unlikely protagonist of a suicidal woman from London. And in the... I just think it works out super well generally, and I'm happy that it exists. But thank you 
for listening to NoClip this week. What are we talking about next time? Uh, next time, uh, we're going to do a 180 and talk about Animal Crossing. Woo! Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, specifically, Animal Crossing New Leaf on the 3DS. Uh, though, honestly... It's Animal Crossing. It's going to be... They're, <laughs> they're in a huge slew of differences between the, the titles. Um, but until that time, if you want to get a hold of us, uh, you can do so at NoClipPodcast.com. Uh, or <laughs> we're happy to announce... Yes. Uh, <laughs> you can now also get a hold of us to uh, Splattershot.pro. <laughs> Which will now link you to our homepage, uh, where you can find our email, our past episodes, uh, Twitter, etc. Uh, check us out on YouTube, uh, give us a rating, review on iTunes, recommend us on Overcast, all the good shit. Oh, dude, I've got to change my favorite so that the link it goes to is now Splattershot.pro <laughs> first. <laughs> this is very important. Uh, thanks <laughs> you're welcome Chad <laughs> hope you had a great time we love you Chad oh, oh god it's like a it's like the, not a nightmare where everybody loves me <laughs> <laughs> make love to us Chad please welcome back to the podcast um, what we were talking about before the break, leading into it, uh, was the visual... St- Actually, yeah, hold on. Because this is an audio medium that I'm going to edit, I'm going to do that again because I feel like every time I come back from the break, I'm like, before the break, we were... I agree. And that's pointless because it's going to be like nine seconds. Yep. <clears throat> Welcome back from the break. Before the break... <laughs> 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 that was intentional. Uh, <laughs> oh, was it? Oh, was it? Now, I don't believe you. I couldn't have been fucked up any worse. <laughs>